really want to cover a few things. Some I have to cover extremely quickly because I want to get to the heart of the talk which has, for me has been extremely thrilling because it's uh, something that I've prepared for the first time particularly for this talk but the first part would be a question does the genome provide evidence for common ancestry and it very much follows on from the last question that Alex gave to Sigrid the second part of my talk which I have to deal with with a little bit of detail is this thought of chromosomal fusion which we will discuss and of course I'm including a word here that sort of betrays the answer which is the myth of chromosomal fusion but what I really want to talk about is ancient man who exactly were the Neanderthals and the Denisovans if I'm saying that correctly I've never heard anybody speak that word so I don't know if I'm pronouncing it correctly I'm really not going to talk about this first part because I gave an extended talk on this subject in 2010 <coughs> does the genome provide evidence for common ancestry so I'm assuming that somewhere out in cyberspace this talk is available I don't know whether that's true or not I can't even remember if it was recorded we looked at a number of things there the things that I want to highlight here were the things that I really specifically spoke about in that talk which are not included in what we might call protein coding genes these are other elements within the genome protein coding genes only amount to two perhaps three percent of the total genome everything else is included in these other categories now from an evolutionary point of view over the years these elements have been taken as evidence of common ancestry but of course my talk I suppose when all is said and done in 2010 was a tale of two books in a sense I'm pretty glad that Elizabeth is not here because she comes from the Faraday Institute and this was one of the books we spoke about in 2010 and I've got a copy of it and if anybody wants to take it and read it then uh, the other book was this one which I was greatly privileged to be involved with should Christians embrace evolution um, one of the things that I find thrilling is that Wayne Grudem made the foreword in that book the problem with the subject that has been used by even theistic evolutionists to look at that region of the DNA that was originally considered as junk is that before you know where you are the rug is pulled from beneath your feet and last year I was able to speak in greater detail of the genetic findings that have come out of the ENCODE project and the thing that's so exciting about that is that we now know that at least 80% remember protein coding genes 2 or 3% but at least 80% of the genome has function so all of these other things no longer provide evidence for the theistic evolutionist or even the evolutionist to say that these are evidence of common ancestry now I've highlighted those three regions again on this slide because the fact is this hold on I'll go back the fact is this we need new definitions what does it mean a pseudo gene when it's actually coding for an RNA okay definitions are a real problem in this area now mobile genomic elements well they're mobile that's okay but retroviral inserts I believe is another term that requires a new definition I'm not going to say any more on that because I've spoken about it at length and I've written about it at length so the question is so does the genome provide evidence for common ancestry regardless of what the fossils say my answer is clearly no from a genetic perspective however I do need to address this second point 
and there's a reason for that human and great ape chromosomes lined up here the human is one chromosome the chimpanzee has two chromosomes in other words humans have 23 pairs of chromosomes great apes whether that be the chimpanzee the orangutan or the gorilla they have 24 pairs of chromosomes the question is has chromosomal fusion taken place it's a very significant question it is assumed that it has taken place because the evolutionary mantra demands it now in my talk and in my book not my book my section in that book should Christians eat embrace evolution I said possibly yes but you see new findings inevitably pull the rug from under your feet so I need to address this point and now it's not a tale of two books <laughs> it's a tale of two Jeffreys Way, I'm one of them now I want to defend myself <laughs> I wasn't dogmatic I said possibly yes okay possibly yes and I wrote about it in that book what did I use? I'm trying my best to use the best academic material that's available and that at the time seemed persuasive to me so I wrote about it in that light however the information the academic data was essentially old and nearly all of it was before the year 2000 remember the ge human genome was published in 2000-2001 the tale of two Jeffreys, I've got to change it you know I'm an English Jeffrey but the other Jeffrey that I'm going to talk about is an American Jeffrey and so I'll give him the benefit of the doubt and change the spelling of the name this is Jeffrey Tompkins he's written a book and I've got a copy of it and if anybody would like to take it uh, I'm very willing to give it away Jeffrey Tompkins now in Answers in Genesis there was this paper published quite recently alleged, interesting word, human chromosome 2 fusion site it's a bit technical encodes an active DNA binding domain inside a complex and highly expressed gene Jeffrey Tompkins has done a lot of work on this issue with Jerry Bergman, Professor Jerry Bergman and I commend their work to you we need to look a little bit at the technicality because this was the rug that was pulled from under my feet lack of syntony, syntony is a technical word it's where looking at genes in different chromosomes in different species there is a lack of syntony at the ends of the ape chromosomes remember they're not fused at this point at the end of the ape chromosomes with the supposed fusion region in the human chromosome believe me I wanted to do this work it didn't involve any experimentation it just is data mining on the genome the published human genome and the published chimpanzee genome the so-called fusion region is populated of course this is in the human chromosome by genes and pseudogenes that are absent from the ape chromosomes they're just not there in the apes they're present at this supposed fusion site in the human and one in particular which is the you probably can't read this at the back an RNA helicase gene which has a, num has a designation double DXL111 now this particular gene is absent in chromosomes 2A on 2B you understand why they're uh, designated 2A and 2B because they come together to produce human chromosome 2 this gene is absent in those chromosomes in the chimpanzee or the gorilla and Tompkins 
and Bergman quote the work of Costa et al, which was published in an academic journal, Genomics, where using immunofluorescence against this particular gene, they could identify where it was and on what chromosomes it was. The fact is this, there are 18 copies of that gene in the human, but there are only two copies in the chimpanzee and only four in the gorilla. And if you look at where they are, you see that they're not in, found in the right places. This is their conclusion. It's technical. I accept that it's technical. Functional, alternatively transcribed, post-transcriptionally -trans spliced, <laughs> post-transcriptionally regulated, and network-connected express genes such as our gene, an RNA helicase, cannot arise by the head-to-head -head fusion of chromosomes. It just isn't possible. I, I think I offended Jerry Bergman once. I tried to have a discussion with him. He wanted to be in touch with me because of what I'd written in that book and what the findings were that they were coming up with. And I pleaded with him, please publish this work in a bona fide, well, can't use that word, in a, in a secular, if you like, academic journal. I pleaded with him to do it. Why do you think they didn't do it, or even avoided doing it? I don't know whether they even attempted to do it, in Nature even, or one of the prestigious academic scientific journals. I believe with all my heart that it would never be accepted because of the rug that is pulled out from under evolutionary mantra, mantra that demands chromosomal fusion to have taken place. When you consider the differences between the human and the chimpanzee chromosomes as a whole, you see that there are vast differences in structure, size and gene content. Chimpanzees have 10% more DNA than the human as it happens. I can't talk about these things now, I have talked about them. But the fact is this, these structural changes have profound implications for sexual reproduction. And therefore I introduce you to come to the workshop and invite you to come there. I think it's tomorrow afternoon. Because for me sexual reproduction is possibly the greatest challenge to Darwin evolutionism. So that is just a preamble. I could talk very much more about all of those things, but I really want to get on to the heart of the matter. Ancient man, who exactly were the Neanderthals and the Denisovans? I want to talk about the discovery of Neanderthal man, the distribution of Neanderthal man, and the DNA of Neanderthal man. It's a 3D talk. And uh, initially the discovery of Neanderthal man and I need to take you to a river. It's in a, a valley. It's the Neander Valley. It's not very far. I don't know whether Alex or Peter <laughs> come from these places. The Neander Tal, the Neander Valley, which is fairly close to Dusseldorf, and near to that valley, there's a cave, the Fieldhofer Grotto. This is where Neanderthal man was discovered. It was discovered in 1856, which is an interesting date. These are some of the finds, the bones, the skull cap, the brow ridge, the very pronounced really strong character here, leg bones. Interestingly, three years before the publication of The Origin of Species. Now, in that book, Charles Darwin avoided the subject of human evolution, although he did say, light will be thrown on the origin <coughs> of man and his history. And of course, he was to write a book which he called The Descent of Man, which was published in 1871. Now we move on to nine, 
1908 when a much more complete skeleton was discovered in France. A nearly complete skeleton, as you can see from his uh, brain box, that he is, has a large brain and of course, like the other finds, a very robust frame, much more so than modern humans. And since then, of course, many, many finds have been found, the distribution of Neanderthal man, and I'm just highlighting four of those places because I will refer to them two more particularly than the other two. We're going to talk more about him and him, but these two are going to be referred to. Also, very briefly, I'm going to show a skull that was discovered in Israel. Of course, they're all found in caves. This is the caveman, right? Why this distribution? It's interesting to me to realize that you can see the extent of the Ice Age in the distribution of ancient man. But now I want to move on to look at what has been found with respect to DNA in the Neanderthal man. Now this paper, this was the first paper that was published actually just before uh, my talk in 2010 and it did briefly refer to it, was the draft sequence of the Neanderthal genome and Svente Pabo is very much involved as we saw a picture of him in Sigrid's talk very much involved in this work a draft sequence of more than four billion nucleotides and that doesn't mean to say that the Neanderthal man has four billion nucleotides I'm sh we've got 3.3 I think billion nucleotides in each of our cells but they took that DNA from three individuals to come up with the draft sequence we show that Neanderthals share more genetic variants with present-day humans in Eurasia than with present-day humans in sub-Sahara Africa. They could come to that conclusion. And here we see it again, Neanderthal signatures in Eurasians. Unfortunately, it gets more complicated from this point on, and of course this is exactly what um, Sigrid was saying with, in her talk. This was later in the year, again in 2010, the genetic history of an archaic hominin group from the Denisova cave in Siberia. From a finger bone found in the Denisova cave in southern Siberia. Here's the cave, here's its location in Siberia, this is the excavations and the different levels of excavation. And this is the finger bone, or at least uh, maybe a cast of the finger bone that was used to extract DNA to come up with, um, to come up with this genome, just from one individual in this case. This is interesting, just to read, this is within the abstract. The individual is from a group that shares a common origin with Neanderthals, but this population was not involved in the putative gene flow from Neanderthals into Eurasians. However, the data suggests that it contributed 4 to 6% of its genetic material to the genomes of present-day Melanesians. So what can we say? Denisovan signatures in Melanesians. But now it gets much more complicated. This is now 2014 in the journal Nature. The complete genome sequence of a Neanderthal from the Altai Mountains. A proximal toe phalanx. Now, Take note, this is a Neanderthal. But the phalanx, the toe phalanx, is found in the east gallery of the Denin Denisova cave, where both the finger and the toe phalanx were found, and is thought to be at least 50,000 years old. I think Andy's question is very pertinent when you come to consider that. <laughs> 
Uh, this is, I think, clutching at straws, that's what I think. The finger was found in sublayer 11.2, whereas the toe derives from a lower or lowest sublayer 11.4 and may thus be older than the finger. I think this is clutching at straws, personally. This is interesting. This is, again, of course, within the paper. Analysis of the relationships and population history of available archaic genomes and 25 present-day human genomes show that several gene flow events occurred among Neanderthals, Denisovans, and early modern humans, possibly including a gene flow into Denisovans from an unknown archaic group. We're talking perhaps three archaic groups, but inevitably it's going to get even more complicated. This is later in the year. A mitochondrial genome sequence of a hominin from Cima de los Huesos This is Cima de los Huesos what does it mean? It means the pit of bones. Again, it's cave, obviously, a very interesting cave in northern Spain. Let's highlight some more words. Mitochondrial genome sequence of a hominin from Cima de los Huesos, closely related to Denisovans. Let's look at the map. Neanderthals here, as well as Denisovans here, Denisovans here and Denisovans here. It's a very complex picture. Highlight a few more words from this article in Nature in 2014, <coughs> mitochondrial genome. question is, what on earth are we talking about here when we consider the mitochondrial genome? This is a little schematic of the human cell or a cell, animal cell, and here you see these little uh, energy generating factories which are called the mitochondria. Amazingly, they contain circular molecules of DNA. In fact, there are about 100, perhaps sometimes 10,000 of these molecules in every cell. This is so interesting to me as a biochemist. Human mitochondrial DNA codes for 13 proteins that are involved in electron transport chains. And you think, well, that's obvious because the electron transport chain is in the mitochondria after all. However, the mitochondria needs around 1,000 proteins, both in its construction and in the formation of the electron <coughs> transport chain. So the question for me is why? 13 in the mitochondria. The rest of the mitochondrial DNA codes for essential RNA molecules, so there are other sequences that code actually for RNAs, particular RNAs. This is a very significant point. Mitochondrial DNA is much more easily mutated because it doesn't have the machinery for error correction in, my, in the mitochondria. It's in the nucleus. That's an important point and we need to remember it. So what do we think we know? Just step back a little bit. Perhaps, can't be dogmatic, three distinct groups of ancient man. The Neanderthals, the Denisovans, and a third unknown group. That's where we are today. And, clearly, modern man in different parts of the world carries different signatures of these groups. And that leads me on to this paper, which was published in 2014. That's our year, isn't it? Yes, it is the genomic landscape of Neanderthal ancestry in present-day humans. Genomic studies have shown that Neanderthals interbred with modern humans. This is accepted. And that non-Africans today are the products of this mixture. Of course, this makes the popular press, and this is 
what The Guardian has to say about these fines, 29th of January 2014, fifth, a fifth of Neanderthal's genetic code lives on in modern humans. And this is what he has to say in the article, of course. The last of Neanderthals may have died out tens of thousands of years ago, but large stretches of their genetic code live on in people today. Many of the Neanderthal genes that live on in people today are involved in making keratin, a protein used in skin, hair and nails. Modern humans may have picked up Neanderthal genes that were better suited to the cold environments, perhaps because they had more or thicker hair or tougher skin. Now this betrays an ignorance here that we need to try to come to terms with. All right, let's think about this for a minute. Evidence of ancient DNA from two or perhaps three sources in, is found in the modern human genome. Exactly what does it mean? This signature. We carry signatures of our ancestry. Exactly what does it mean? <coughs> Are we talking, as indeed the Guardian is inclined to talk, of different genes on different chromosomes? Absolutely not. We are not talking about protein coding genes. We need, all of us need, the entire component of protein coding genes. It, what, it, what it makes the proteins that is the machinery that we need to be physically alive. What we're talking about here, and it's interesting because there's an enormous confusion out there, we are talking different alleles, which are involved in the variation of the expression of those genes. And with respect, <coughs> This is what the academic literature says. Neanderthal alleles, Neanderthal alleles. That's what they're talking about. They're not talking about different protein coding genes. We identify multiple Neanderthal derived alleles, Neanderthal alleles that continue to shape human biology. So in other words, different <coughs> alleles and I would venture to suggest that are within the non-protein coding regions of our genome will affect the expression of any given gene. And I want to give you a very clear example of this because it's also relevant. We often talk about have I got genes for blue eyes or genes for brown eyes? I've got a blue gene I, my eyes are bluish grey, so have I got a bluey grey gene? Is that true? It's not true at all. Who's got blue eyes? Who's got brown eyes? <laughs> Adam, that's good. <laughs> now this is all about melanin expression in the iris. Now this is the melanin production pathway. Tyrosine is the initiating compound. There's uh, an enzyme, a protein enzyme called MEL-A, tyrosinase, which forms dopaquinone, which then non-enzymatically, let's go back, non-enzymatically produces melanin. <coughs> melanin is not a protein. It's not a protein. If there is a low expression of MEL-A in our iris, our eye colour is going to be blue. <coughs> if we have a high expression of male A in our iris, we will have brown eyes. It's all about the regulation of gene expression, which is conducted in those non-protein coding regions. 
So if we have an allele for blue eyes or an allele for brown eyes, it will reside not within the protein coding gene, but outside of it. Of course, the question is, perhaps just one amino acid can be altered in the protein, and here it is just tyrosinase. What happens? Tyrosinase is no longer active. What do we get? We get albinism. These have got, actually, if this was clear, they probably got red eyes under certain light because they've got no expression of melanin at all in their iris. This is not a trivial issue because when we consider the signatures that we carry from the Neanderthal or the Denisovan or maybe from a third archaic group, we're not talking genes, protein coding genes, we're not. We're talking of those regions, non-protein coding regions in our genome that do show some variation which leads to changing gene expression of our fixed number of genes. I want to show you another face. This is uh, something really interesting that was published quite recently, again March 2014, not very long ago. Derived immune and ancestral pigmentation alleles, see the word, in a 7,000 year old Mesolithic European. This was a real shock, I don't know whether you saw reports of this in the popular media. The Labrana individual carols ancestral alleles in several skin pigmentation genes suggesting that the light skin of the modern Europeans was not yet ubiquitous in Mesolithic times. This is not such an old individual, but amazingly he expresses a dark skin, amazingly he expresses a dark skin with blue eyes. It wasn't expected. He, they thought he was going to be very pale, a pale-skinned European, not that long ago. It was a big shock. And I asked this question. No. You don't think so? No. Because <laughs> <laughs> I know that Sigrid in her talk oh. wanted to say this too, and I wanted to say it as well. Too because much Too much hair, <laughs> maybe. <laughs> that is true. So this is the final part of my talk and I think I'm doing okay for time. What does the Bible say about ancient man? This is the most important thing to me when all is said and done. For example, is Adam the actual father of humanity? It's important to us as evangelicals. Or is he the federal head of humanity a Neolithic farmer chosen by God around 10,000 years ago. The reason that I say that is I want to return to this book. I'm glad Elizabeth is not here. This is Dennis Alexander's book, and this is what he writes. God, in his grace, chose a couple of Neolithic farmers in the Near East, or maybe a community of farmers, to whom he chose to reveal himself in a special way. It is for this reason that this first couple or community have been termed homo divinus. This term was coined by John Stott. And as an Englishman, I real the first Christian book I was ever given before I came to faith in Jesus was Basic Christianity by John Stott. So I'm, I'm not underestimating how significant that person is. Although I think here he was totally misguided. What does Dennis think about the Neanderthals? It has been possible, this is on page 221 of his book, if anybody wants it you can take it, it's been possible to extract DNA from Neanderthal bones, specimens, and, an analy and, and analysis of mitochondrial DNA, I think I've got a spelling mistake, is consistent with the idea that humans and Neanderthals last shared a common ancestor about 500,000 years ago and that there was no significant interbreeding between the two species. You know, it's very... You need to be very, very thoughtful about putting things into print. 
I'm very thoughtful about this and I realised, you know, rug was pulled from under my feet. Absolutely rugs have been pulled from under Dennis's feet many, many times and others who want to follow this evolutionary mantra. Something to ponder and it's a verse in the Bible. This is what it says in the book of Acts. From one, I put into brackets the word man because it's not there in the original Greek. From one, and that's very significant because the Bible speaks about one. There's one, Adam, even from him came the second. He made every nation of men that should inhabit the whole earth and he determined the time set for them and the exact places where they should live. This is an interesting diagram. It's from National Geographic, so it's not coming from a creationist source. And you see the migration of ancient man. Melanesians coming this way and Eurasians here and so on and so on and so on. And of course it's really interesting to overlay the extent of the Ice Age onto this diagram. And of course it fits with the one that I put together. Well, no, no, the background is available, but I've put this extent of Ice Age. You've got movement, maybe, of three different archaic groups. This is a little bit contrived, I admit it. I'm just going to put a little red dot in the middle of this migration pattern for the simple region that this is Mount Ararat. And you've got three archaic ancient men. Of course we've got to bring Babel into this. <laughs> the descendants of Japheth, the descendants of Shem, the descendants of Ham. Now obviously I'm not being dogmatic because the picture is very confused. It's an approximation. It's encouraging to think that there were three groups of archaic human, actually. I want to just recommend this book, this book maybe you wouldn't look at twice, but it's a really, really well documented uh, book by Bill Cooper. I've got a copy here. This book shows how European history can be traced right back to the flood and the descendants of Japheth through contemporary accounts and the table of nations. It's a good book. You might not think so when you look at the book cover, but I recommend it. So the question is, is the Bible true? Jesus said, your word is truth. With great respect to Dennis Alexander, I am convinced he's an evangelical. He must also agree that the Bible is true. But of course Pilate said to Jesus, what is truth? It's easy to interpret in lots of different ways. So I want to change the question. Is the Bible factual? And I want to throw up a verse. Altogether Adam lived 930 years and then he died. And very quickly I want to put onto this screen what the early chapters of Genesis speak about when they talk about the ages of men when they had children and when they died. Very specific, detailed analysis. Very interesting that the flood comes at this time and the name Methuselah means that when he dies it will be sent. And Methuselah dies in the year of the flood. Very precise, it's very precise. Two years after the flood, when Shem was a hundred years old, he became the father of Aphaxat. And then of course we go right the way down the list. The names are all there, the dates, the years are all there. And very interestingly, after the flood, longevity declined. It took many generations. Even Joseph was 110 years old when he died. Very interesting. 
Nature 2013, germline mitochondrial DNA mutations aggravate ageing and can impair brain development. Fantastic stuff. We show that low levels of germline transmitted mitochondrial DNA mutations per se can have a lifelong consequences and cause premature aging. And what is more, this is really interesting, I have to go through it quickly, targeted retrieval analysis of five Neanderthal mitochondrial DNA genomes just to highlight something, mitochondrial DNA genetic diversity, remember five Neanderthal genomes, was approximately one third of that in contemporary modern humans. What's it saying? It's saying that there wasn't so much mutation in archaic man as there is today. And another paper, 2012, High coverage genome sequence of an archaic Denisovan individual. Genetic diversity in these archaic hominins was extremely low. This is science. This is not a creationist journal speaking. We're talking here of the descent of man. Which was Charles Darwin's book published in 1871. In his Origin of the Species, he says, light will be thrown on the origin of man and his history. The problem is, as Jesus said, if the light within you is darkness, how great is that darkness? This is a much better book. I know Andy will also agree. I have some copies with him. Thank you, Andy. Genetic Entropy and the mystery of the genome, John Sanford, recommended. The flood, but the person that I want to highlight here is Abraham, who was 175 years old when he died. Adam lived 175 years, his sons Isaac and Ishmael buried him in the cave. At the moment I can pass by Hebron. <laughs> through the occupied territories. And I can visit where Abraham was buried, although if we actually found his bones, it might look a little bit like this. Ancient man, more robust, bigger brain, characteristic brow ridges. But another fantastic truth is that cranial craniofacial bones and tissues alter with longevity. This is an old paper, the dichotomous pattern of craniofacial <coughs> expansion during aging. The cranial facial skeleton expands during adult life. The dual enlargement, it's dichotomous. It's, what it means is, is the front of the face changes far more than the back of the head. More recent paper, aging in the mid-face, bony elements, a three-dimensional computer, computed tomo tomographic study. This is what they say. These results suggest that the bony elements of the mid-face change dramatically with age and coupled with soft tissue changes lead to the appearance of the aged face. I'm going to use an example. Who's this person? Any ideas? Charles Darwin. It is Charles Darwin. This is not a photograph, of course. This was him painted as a seven-year-old in the 1816. Fantastic example of this. This is him as a young man. This is him as an older man, 45 years old. <laughs> I don't think I look quite as old as this when I was 45. This is Charles Darwin as an old man. You see his brow ridge. This is a skull that was found in Israel with its brow ridge. Of course, Charles Darwin is an interesting example because he was only in his 70s when he died. But just think, 175 years old. 
See the difference between him as a young man and as an old man. This is one of the f Neanderthal children that have been discovered and I showed you um, in my initial slide where this was found. He doesn't have a brow ridge. This is his, this is his skeleton. He's just a child, he might be two years old. This is an even younger Mesmeaskaya neonate, newly born. This is the recreation of his skull. No brow ridge. I want to introduce the work of somebody who I regard as a friend now, Jack Quozo, because he had unparalleled access to Neanderthal skulls. And here you see in his book some of the x-ray analyses that he did on the size and the shape. Really, really commend this book. I, I wish he'd written it a little bit differently because he's got, it's very, very detailed. There's a lot of technical detail in this book, but he begins the book as if he is Indiana Jones. And I don't think that goes down quite so well in a serious uh, audience, but uh, I have the highest regard for this man's work. He was a professional orthodontist, very significant. He and his son, who is a professor, have developed an algorithm for skull changes over time. And the other very interesting thing that Jack has shown in his work, he's not, he's not speculating, he's shown it because of un, unerupted teeth, he's an orthodontist, has demonstrated slow maturation in the adult Neanderthal. And this is really interesting because academic literature also supports that idea of a slower paced development, albeit large late maturing, late maturing mothers, than in modern Homo sapiens. Maturation took, was much, much slower. Here you see the reason why this large skull, larger skull, in a, even in a neonate Neanderthal, requires a much more substantial pelvis. On the other hand, and, and Jack brings some of these thoughts out in his book, although he wrote the book several years ago. This is 2012. The International Journal of Epidemiology the decreasing age of puberty as much a psychosocial as biological problem, it's asking a question. This is a fact, just as we are thinking of genetic deterioration. The mean age of puberty in girls in Western populations has been falling for the last 150 years. What's happened is our maturation is getting faster and faster and faster. And so in summary, how am I going for time? I think I'm okay. I, modest here, I'm being modest. The genome provides little evidence for common descent. Whatever those skulls are, whatever those creatures are that Sigrid has so beautifully told us about, when you get down to the genetics, there's nothing to support common ancestry. Nothing. And now I can say this, chromosomal fusion, which is part of the evolutionary mantra, is an absolute myth. The fact is we carry allelic signatures from ancient man, certainly Neanderthal, Denisovan, and perhaps another. And we generally accept this in the scientific community. Ancient man coexisted, cohabited, and interbred with Homo sapiens because ancient man was fully human. The skeletal characteristics of ancient man is indicative of great age and slow maturation. This is supported by the fact that mitochondrial DNA is more easily mutated, resulting in premature aging in my opinion. The Bible is accurate and compatible with scientific discovery. So, what makes us 
fully human. And at this point I want to go back to the valley, the Neander Valley, the Neander Tal. If any man is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has gone, the new has come.